there a difference between artistic science and scientific art? Has the general public uh, sort of lost its interest in science and technology and engineering? H how do we present science in a new way, in a fresh way? I think when you talk to young school children and children in their early teens, quite often you find they're actually very, very interested in science. There's a natural curiosity. But something happens in the mid-teens. And in the South, it happens around about the age of 16, maybe here in the North, a little bit earlier. But at that point, they have to make a decision. What do I want to be when I grow up? And unfortunately, so few of them seem to consider science or technology or engineering as a career. And myself, the, uh, what's the word, the provost, the provost of Trinity College at the University of Dublin, John Hecate, the president of the university, and a senior scientist there, Professor Mike Cowie, pondered about these problems in about 2005. And at that time, in our economy, we had lots of bankers, yes, lots of accountants, lots of lawyers, a few property speculators hanging around there somewhere. But we also had lots of multinationals. And they were saying, we just can't get enough technologists, enough scientists, enough engineers. And the indigenous sector was saying, we cannot get enough scientists, enough technologists, enough engineers. And there was a sense, I think, for many that, you know, to be a scientist, technology engineer, Maybe it's a bit passé. Uh, you need mathematics, and mathematics is hard. Maybe there's much easier ways to make money than being a scientist or being an engineer. And so getting people into that, consider, you know, considering that as a career, was, was very, very difficult. And I don't think we just struggle with that on this island of Ireland, but I think, in fact, it's a global problem, particularly in, in the Western economies, and quite often they're running on empty. So. John Hegarty, Mike Cowie, myself, asked ourselves, well, what are we going to do about this? Now, in the South, we don't have a science museum. Now, there were many wonderful science museums, and if you've never been to the Chicago Museum of Industry and Science, in my view, it's one of the best in the world. It's a fascinating building. They've actually got a complete U2, uh, uh, sorry, not a complete U2, a complete U-boat uh, in there, which is fascinating to walk through. If you go to... I don't know, the Deutsches Museum in Munich. It's absolutely astonishing. It's fascinating. Go to the Computer History Man uh, uh, Museum in Mountain View in Silicon Valley. Fascinating place with pretty much every model of every computer that's ever been built, the history of computing in, in one building. Bletchley Park, just outside London, a fascinating place about the history of mathematics and the application of mathematics and cryptography during the Second World War. There are all these places but you sort of stand back from them and say, the problem about museums, the problem about museums is it's very difficult to bring them to life. You know, you're talking about history, you're talking about exhibits, you're talking about things in the past, and they're dead. They're beautiful, but they're dead. And trying to inspire the Facebook generation and young kids about a career in science and engineering and technology when this is what you're presenting is kind of difficult, we think. Now, some of the science museums do wonderful jobs in, in presenting little experiments where you can get your hands dirty and try something, but quite often these are toy experiments. They're not a real thing, and they're kind of sort of a little bit condescending. That's my view. Maybe you'll disagree with me. So we sort of said we want to do something different. We don't quite know what it is. Yes, it's abstract, <laughs> to use that word again. We don't quite know what we're going to do, it's the science something. It's not the science museum. It's the science something. But we want to guarantee, if you walk into our science, whatever we're going to call it, in the afternoon, and then you come back in the evening, and then you come back tomorrow morning, every time you go into it, it's going to be different. You're going to have a different experience. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be live. It's going to be interesting. It's fascinating. It's a place to meet people. You're going to meet thinkers, artists, mathematicians, journalists, actors, philosophers, poets engineers, technologists, scientists, you're going to meet a real scientist. Um, maybe they wear a white coat. You don't know. You're going to find out. And you're going to get to ask the scientist, why on earth do you do what you're doing? 
you know, what's so fascinating about what you're doing? But I think probably the deepest question of all that any young teenager would want to ask a real scientist, and their parents would certainly want to ask that real scientist is, is there any money in this? <laughs> is this a career? Can you make money being a scientist? Is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? So we felt that whatever we were going to do, we we're going to put scientists on the shop floor, real people, and it was all about engagement with, with, with science. And as we thought and struggled for a word, you know, was it going to be this, was it going to be the science museum, was it going to be the science theatre, science cinema, science centre, science exhibition, we eventually came up with the word gallery, in the sense of an art gallery. It's a place where there's exhibits, it's a place where you can meet the artists, you can dialogue with them, and so we built the science gallery. Now, this was a car park in 2005, and we started fundraising for this sort of abstract concept of what it is we want to build, and um, we eventually built it. And if you look at it, it's right on a major thoroughfare. In fact, you can't see it, but it's actually close to one of the, the main railway stations in Dublin, Pier Street Dart Station. It's right close to the major entrance to the University of Dublin, uh, it's glass front, so as you're walking down the street, you can look in and see what's happening. As you're driving down the street, you can look in, and we were always fearful that there was going to be an accident, and you know, people sort of gawking as they're driving down the street, because there's a lot of, quite often, light and light shows in there. Glass fronted, no admission fee. That was one of the golden rules, no admission fee. So you can imagine us going to the government saying, please give us some money to help build our building, and they'd say, well, we'd say, we're not going to charge anything, and they'd say, you've got to charge something. And we'd say, no, we don't want to charge anything. We want people to be able to walk in any time and see what's going on. The layout was that, yes, there was going to be a theater, and of course we'd have lectures, and we'd have people talking as I'm talking to you now, and indeed we'd have TEDxs in Dublin hosted in our theater. There'd be gallery space, there'd be workshops and studio, but one of the most important parts of it was a cafe, and a good cafe, where you can get a nice cup of coffee, right? and reasonable food, not too expensive, but it was a place also, the cafe was a focal point to meet people. It was a hip place to go, to go meet people at the science gallery, see what's happening in there today. You'd never know who you might meet. Philosophers, journalists, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, inventors, you never know. It's a place, in fact, to meet people. We opened after a lot of difficulty fundraising, but we got there eventually with some wonderful assistance from philanthropists, in particular the Nocton family, but also some government support, also some commercial support. And we opened in February 2008 with our first exhibition, Lightwave, The Science of Light. And yes, it's a ship's bow, but since then, our building and the exhibitions we've had have been many. Um, Right now, we've just finished Edible, the science of, of food. We have Happy, the science of happiness. We've had Surface Tension, the science of water. Elements, about every uh, element of the chemical table, the periodic table. We've had Hyperbolic Coral Reef, which is the science of the mathematics of hyperplanes, described using knitting. We've had uh, techno threads. We've had infectious. Infectious was one of our great ones because the, the, the signage for infectious was infection, stay away. <laughs> and of course, everybody came straight in. <laughs> and it happened. We had great, great timing. Well, maybe you've got to be slightly cautious about what I say here. We did it in April 2009. That's when infectious opened. And that was about two weeks before the worldwide pandemic of, of bird flu and the H1N1 virus. Now, we did not cause that, I hasten to add, but our timing was great. We've had green machines where uh, different projects around the green agenda, and as a member of the public, you could come in and, if you like, invest in, using conceptual money, what was uh, the best idea in your thought, in your mind. But the whole idea, really, was to bring scientists right into, into the building. We had Love Lab the science of attraction. And of course, we opened that on Valentine's night, of course. But the idea of conducting actually live science in the building, I mean, real science with real scientists, and using the public as the, the 
the guinea pigs, if you will, obviously on a volunteer basis, but we conduct real science in the building, in front of the public. So it's almost a theater space for science. It, it's, it's, it's the theatrics of science, but you get to, to, to see it. And that scientific work is published. It is actually published in top scientific journals. So it was all about putting scientists in front of the public, putting science students in front of the public, and science students, what we call mediators, explaining to ordinary members of the public, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, and making our young graduates much more articulate and confident about talking about science and explaining it in layman's terms, a skill that they will in inevitably need in their career as they go into the commercial world or indeed even into, into government circles. Let me play you a video of saying something about what we're doing. I came to work in the science gallery as a mediator and it just sparked off the, the love of science again and made me remember why I'd started it, why I'd done it in the first place. I think what's nice about the science gallery is that it can inspire people. So very often as a mediator you see people walk in and, and maybe they wouldn't be interested or they wouldn't understand and they leave with this genuine feeling of inspiration. They really feel like what you've told them is important and it's something that they'll remember for the rest of their lives, I think. To be honest, the Science Gallery has kind of changed my life in a strange kind of way because it really allowed me to engage with the general public and we ran an experiment here all through Infectious, got loads of samples off the Irish population and examined their immune systems in great detail. That was a great thrill. I think nobody else in the world had been able to do that. I really love being in the gallery. People are coming in and talking to them. They say, what are you doing? What are you working on? And they ask questions in ways that I haven't framed them myself, so it does help my research in, in a certain way. It helps my students because they get excited again when they see everybody else being excited about their work. I enjoy the interaction and kind of sharing, I suppose, my enjoyment and my enthusiasm. It's ended up being a, a really great experience. Science Gallery. I don't know what it is and that's part of the excitement. I think one of the great things about Science Gallery is how unpredictable it is and how every time it succeeds in surprising me with the way you do things. So I don't know what it is and I'm happy that way. As I said, to me the Science Gallery is the most exciting development in Trinity, maybe even in Ireland for science, because uh, it brings together all these interesting people. It's got a crossover between the arts and the sciences, which is wonderfully thrilling really. And I can see it just going from strength to strength. So I've been chair of the fundraising committee for the Science Gallery since uh, 2006, 
putting the funds together to raise the building. And then subsequently, uh, since 2008, when we opened and shared the governing board, and uh, obviously our, the team that we put together has just been fantastic. Michael John Gorman is our director. We hired him just before we opened. It's just a fantastic team. But Aoife asked in the video, you know, what next for the science gallery? Well, let me tell you, at the moment, in New York, the surface tension exhibition is running, the science of water. Next week, in Singapore Science Center, Biorhythm, which is the science of the influence of music on the body and the mind, is running in Singapore. Biorhythm was in New York last week. Uh, sorry, last, uh, last year, excuse me. Elements, uh, our exhibition about chemistry, was running in the Scienza Bergamo in Italy earlier this year. Biorhythm is going to the Polytechnic in Moscow next December. And one of the most fantastic things was at the start of this year, Google gave us $1 million to franchise the Science Gallery as a concept worldwide. And over the next couple of years, we hope to have eight further science galleries around the planet. And it looks like London is going to probably be the first. We've actually got a number of partners that we're in discussions with, but London right now looks probably to be the first one. And we hope to see the London Science Gallery open reasonably soon. But let me go back to, is it artistic science or is it scientific art? One of the, I think, amazing things about art and science today is how they've merged. Um, if you think about modern art, the very act of observation changes the form of what you're seeing, and that's the style of modern art. And if you think of modern science and quantum mechanics and the Heisenberg principle, the very act of observation changes what you are seeing, what, what's there, what's, what the form is. And there is a merging in many of the concepts between these two, and it's a way of thinking about science and art in tiny new ways, explaining these to the public. It's been an incredibly exciting journey. I'm so excited now because we can now bring the Science Gallery International. And as I said, we're touring exhibitions already at this point and look forward to a really great future. Oh, and one thing before I go, um, an art gallery is somewhere where you put up exhibits and people come and see them, and people collect them and pay for them, and art has value. I wonder could we ever get to the point where science exhibits have value and are collectibles? Now that's an idea worth spreading. <laughs>